Heavenly Father, uh, as we uh, gather today, and, and we bless you uh, again for this opportunity uh, to gather, uh, we never know, Lord, when this opportunity will be taken away, uh, whether it be by the civil authorities or by health issues uh, or circumstances that are beyond our control. But we thank you and bless you and praise you that we can be uh, with fellow saints uh, of like mind and heart uh, who want to worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, the only God and Savior of all men. Uh, Lord, we uh, come into your presence through prayer. Today, as we gather, uh, we bow our hearts and we uh, want to bless you uh, for such amazing grace, uh, not only during this time, uh, but from the time uh, that we came into this world, uh, you have set your hearts on us in eternity. Uh, uh, it's uh, incredibly amazing, and we bless you for that. And we pray uh, this hour, this day, if we haven't already done so, that we uh, would comprehend uh, the greatness of God, uh, the vastness of your love and your grace and your mercy and your goodness to Adam's race and your goodness to us uh, for those who believe. And uh, Lord, I, uh, I, I read up here what David wrote and what Harold read this morning. You're our light and our salvation, our stronghold, the defense of our life. Uh, we, uh, we thank you. Uh, Father, I uh, think of um, still the many needs uh, physically in our congregation. Uh, and they're so numerous, I can't begin to think of Fred. We lift up Fred this morning. Uh, thank you that uh, Patricia's here. Uh, we lift up Edith Perfetti, uh, that you uh, would touch the lungs and bring healing and remove the pneumonia. Uh, Cindy Ellis, Father. Uh, uh, bring healing to that ankle, and then Kathy Howard T. May you divinely touch her neck uh, from the neck surgery. Um, continue to be with the Johnson family and Maria with uh, her constant infirmities, and uh, Keith with the uh, dialysis uh, the three times a week. Um, but we thank you uh, that your grace is sufficient in all circumstances, um, and we. Uh, but we do lift these people up and pray that you encourage their hearts. Uh, we pray also, Father, too, uh, for our country. Uh, Lord, I don't know where to begin for our country because we definitely reap what we've sown. Uh, we've pushed you out of our culture, out of our society, in many respects out of our government, and uh, even out of our churches. And Lord, uh, we, uh, we lift up our country. Um, we uh, pray for race relations. Uh, we pray for equal justice for everyone. Uh, we pray that there would be some sanity and clear thinking politicians that are elected. Uh, we pray that you would, uh, if it be your will, Heavenly Father, that you would. Um, uh, cover this uh, great political divide and even uh, financial divide, uh, social divide. Uh, we know that we're all one in Christ for those of us who believe, and it's our prayer uh, that the gospel would go forth in this country um, and that message would uh, resonate uh, that we're all one in Christ and no one is any better, any different. Uh, any less, any more. And uh, we pray that these truths uh, that are foundational to the church would also be uh, true and foundational to our society, our halls of justice, our halls of um, legislative government, uh, and also uh, with the executive uh, powers of people, uh, would not favor one group of uh, people, group, or persons. Uh, we pray for our president, 
We pray for those in Congress. We pray for the Supreme Court. Uh, Father, may uh, they tap into the wisdom from above and not from the demonic wisdom that seems to be prevailing uh, during this time. Uh, but we know that you're God, and we know uh, that all things come of you, uh, all circumstances, all times, all events. Um, we know that you're in all and over all and through all. And uh, Maranatha, Lord, as the scripture says, uh, and we thank you uh, that uh, we are safe and secure in your hands. And we want to give you all the praise and all the honor and the glory of this hour, this day. And God's people said, Amen. 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 From Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power, that is at work within us. To him be the glory in the church, and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Let's commit this time to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, I uh, pray that you would remove any distractions, that you would give us ears to hear, hearts to perceive, uh, that the Holy Spirit of God, uh, who's, who indwells us, uh, who is present here, would open the eyes of our hearts and give us understanding to uh, the Scripture this morning, and we pray in Jesus' name. So folks, uh, we're going to conclude our study in the Ephesians chapter 3 passage, and we're going to look at Paul's doxology this morning. Uh, we're actually going to take a look at verses 20 and 21, which is the doxology portion. Now, the key to understanding Paul's doxology in verses 20 through 21 is to take a look at, and we don't obviously have time to read this or take a look at it, but if you consider everything that Paul has written in chapter 1, verse 1, to the end of chapter 3, Paul has this within his thought. Everything that God has done for believers, raised in Christ, seated in Christ, sealed by the Holy Spirit of God, made fellow heirs with the Jewish people to form the church, chapter 2, brought under one roof, which we call the church. All that God has done for the saints, then the Apostle Paul breaks forth in this doxology. And he's absolutely amazed at what God has done. It's also the conclusion of his prayer. Now, if you've been following us on Facebook, YouTube, you know, looking at it through the website, you've noticed that we've broken the prayer down into four parts. Some want to do two parts, some want to do three parts, some want to do two parts with subparts. I've broken it into four parts, all right? But this is Paul's doxology conclusion for the way in which God works in and through the church to his glory. Now, let me give you a formal definition of a doxology. Okay, and this comes out of Oxford's uh, dictionary. It's a liturgical formula of praise to God. Essentially, it's giving God praise, blessing God. And doxologies are typically used in the context of worship. For example, we just sang a doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. That's a doxology. Okay. Now, doxologies are not uncommon in Scripture. In fact, uh, Nick when he read the Romans passage earlier, Romans 16, 25 through 27, that's a doxology. Let me read for you Jude's doxology in verses 24 and 25. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, 
be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority for all time, and now and forever. Amen. Great, great doxology. Now, when we come to Paul's doxology in verses 20 and 21, now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all that we can ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Folks, these are some great, great verses. And you can't read this without saying amen, amen. And you can't read this without having great conviction that God is great and he does great things. We talk about the greatness of God. We can, we can talk about how big God is. I, I did a sermon on this, I don't know, a year and a half ago. Theologians talk about God's immensity. You know, he, you know, he's so vast, so large, so big, right? But we can also talk about the greatness of God in terms of his person, his character, his heart, his works, his disposition, who he is. All that he is. That has nothing to do with his immensity. You know, you ever meet like a really wonderful person? I said, oh, they're really cool. They're, they're a great, great person. That's not going to drop in the bucket to who, who God is. In fact, when you meet great people and wonderful people, that's just a reflection of who God is. Just a little tiny drop. So greatness has to do with how he fills all time and all space and all eternity and, uh, and heaven and earth and the entire universe. But it also has to do with the quality of his person. Uh, the scripture refers to him as indescribable, incomprehensible, wonderful. So God is wonderfully a great person. His salvation is great in the Lord Jesus Christ. His gospel is great. His works are great. And they come to us through the fullness and the richness of his heart. And if you take a look at this doxology, we encounter his greatness in both of these ways. Now, to him who is able to do exceedingly above, and he's willing to do it. And Paul here sees God's power as so great and unlimited in scope in his ability to do anything and everything that we could ever think or imagine, or ask for, or desire. He is able to do. I like how one scholar expressed it. He said, uh, quote, God is able to do what believers ask in prayer. He is able to do what they might fail to ask, but what they can think. He is able to do all they ask or think. He is able to do above all they ask or think. He is able to do abundantly above all they ask for thing. He is able to do more abundantly above all they ask for thing. He is able to do infinitely more abundantly above all they ask for thing. And he goes on to say, what is more, this indescribable power is at work in us. Isn't that incredible? So we have his greatness in his ability to do nothing is impossible with God. His greatness is manifested in his in, in what he does for his people. His willingness to do. Has anybody ever asked you to do something or you've asked something did you've asked somebody to do something for you? And maybe they haven't been willing? <laughs> or maybe they've been very willing. What a blessing. Right? It is his willingness to do for you and me. Now he doesn't have to do. You're going to hear a lot of preachers who will say, you just name it, when you ask God anything, and he'll do it for you. God doesn't work that way. Do you do that with your children? Absolutely not. We have a bunch of hellions running around. If you gave your kids everything you wanted, or they wanted, it would be bad. Amen? And if God gave us everything that we wanted, it would be bad for them. But here, here's, here's the thing. When Paul envisions his greatness to do for his people, it's his willingness to do. 
Because he doesn't have to do it. He's God. You know, you say to your kids, go do this, and you expect them to do it, right? You don't say to God, do this. You ask them. Now, for the past four weeks, uh, we've been looking at Paul's prayer, as I mentioned earlier. And let me break it down for you very, very quickly. Uh, verse 16, Paul's prayer is for the, the work of God strengthening in the inner person of the believer. Uh, Paul's prayer in verse 17, that we would be strengthened by faith, not sight, but by faith, knowing that as in God indwells our hearts, as he takes up residence, that that faith works in the strengthening process. He talks about being rooted and grounded in God's love, verse 17. And then verses 18 and 19, that the saints would comprehend the vastness of God's love, that we would be full in him. Now, I mentioned last week when I talked about this, there's a lot of, there's a lot of believers who are not real full because one week they think that God loves them and the next week they think that's okay with them. And the next week they think that God doesn't love them. And they think that they can lose their salvation and then they have their salvation. And it's like, remember I said this when I, when I was a little kid, you know, you have a crush on a girl, little, take a little title, she loves me, she loves me. And then when, you know, when it ends up where she doesn't love me, you pick another one. Right? You, and you hope you finish up where she loves me. People do that with God because they do not comprehend the vastness of His love. And so it's in this context when we comprehend all these things and we understand God's mighty work in us, Paul breaks forth in this doxology of praise to God and he blesses God for what He's doing in the church, which is God's people. And he's excited about that. As an apostle, he's excited about what God is doing in his own heart and how God is using him in the church and what God is doing in the hearts of all the people in the church and how that extends out to families and communities and people and governments. Are you excited about what God is doing in your life? Thank you, Eddie. Amen. Amen. Now, I have to tell you, every, some days I'm like not too thrilled. Because that's my sinful nature. But when I pull back and I have the Holy Spirit come upon me in the way of like reflection, it's like, thank God. Thank God that God divinely intervened in my life and gave me direction and change and just kept me from self destructing because that's what I was doing. And that's what you would have done, too. This is the work. Conforming us to the image of Christ. Do you know what that image is? That is so glorious and so divine and so beautiful and so magnificent. We try to conquer it. We try to. The beauty and the glory of Christ. That's an amazing thing, folks. I've said this before. I read it years ago in seminary. Every man and woman is a castle in ruins. And God begins to rebuild the castle. Amen? I get excited about that. Because I, I look in the mirror. Beard or no beard, Marie. I look in the mirror every day, and I don't always see the light that I see. But God loves me. And he likes what he sees because he's changing me from glory to glory. And you too. Uh, so we have this doxology, and it somewhat follows his prayer, and it's and it's more of a summation of God's ability to do. Let's let's kind of let's kind of break this down a little bit here. So we, we cannot fathom or totally comprehend his love. Boy, Nathan is taking that outside. <laughs> there you go, Nathan. Okay. Uh, so we, we can't fathom or totally comprehend this love. How do we express it in words? And yet, Paul attempts to do that. He's led by the Holy Spirit in his attempt, because it's scripture, right? Paul uses this phrase, exceedingly abundantly beyond all. 
So I have to, I have to tell you, uh, I went, I've got to be my witness, I went through 75 to 80 commentaries in preparing for this message. I tried to do my homework. <laughs> Could you not? One commentator said, this is bad grammar with great theology. Some of you are kidding me. This is great grammar. God wrote it. Right? <laughs> bad grammar. I can do bad grammar. No problem. All day long. Uh, this is a very, very un unusual phrase. Uh, and, 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 and another scholar said, Paul's rhetorical ability is stretched beyond to a breaking point as he attempts to express his vision as if the apostles groping for words of comparison. It's like saying very super, very super early abundantly, and all these adverbs kind of like bunched in together. That's what it is. Uh, another scholar said, this is the strongest language you will ever find when it comes to being encouraged to ask or think. I might challenge him a little bit on that. Uh, I would put, you know, remember Jesus said, ask, seek, not. I'll put that right up there with that too, right? Encourages you to come. Finally, one other scholar said regarding this phrase, Paul wants his readers to have a theological perspective on God's mighty saving purposes. And I'm going to add to that in your life. In your life. You think? This is what is lacking in our churches today. Because I'm telling you people, people, pastors get up and they run around and back and forth and they whip everybody up and they tell them and teach them nothing. It's true. Nothing. They don't know the scriptures and this is why they're this way all over. This is a perspective on God's mighty saving purposes. And to put it in perspective, the Apostle Paul was not only blown away by what God did, but by also what he chooses to do for you and me. And it's beyond imagination and human thought, and yet he attempts to express it in a way that we can perhaps capture that vision. And other saints do it today as well. Uh, I couldn't help, when I came across this phrase, exceedingly abundantly beyond all. I, I couldn't think, I help but think of Andre Couch's My Tribute. Right? Let me read it for you. How can I say thanks for all the things you've done for me? Things so undeserved you gave to prove your love for me. Voices of the million angels could not express my gratitude. All that I am and ever hope to be, I owe it all to thee. To God be the glory, to God be the glory, to God be the glory, for the great things he has done. With his blood he has saved me, with his power he has raised me. To God be the glory for the things he has done. Just let me live my life, let it be pleasing Lord to thee. And if I gain any praise, let it go to Calvary. And then the doxology, to God be the glory. That's a tremendous expression of the abundantly above, beyond all that we could ever ask for. God wants to do. Uh, I love what another commentator wrote, and I'll share this with you. Uh, uh, when it comes to asking God and God's willingness, he said, Hagar asked for a drop of water, and God gave her a well. Saul sought for his father's donkeys, and God gave him a crown. David asked for bread, and he received the kingdom. And the guy goes on to write, And God does more than we desire. Joseph wishes only to be free from iron chains. Behold, God only not does what he desires, but gives him golden chains besides. You know, the second command in all of Egypt. From iron chains to golden chains. I know I love that. That's the first part of his doxology. God, praise God, he's working in and through us, the church. A miraculous and wonderful work. Very quickly, the second part here, he does this according to the power that works in us. And this harkens back to verse 16. It's Holy Spirit power. And this is the work of God. To bestow grace, we are what we are by the grace of God. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 10. 
It's the work of God to sanctify, to purge, and to cleanse us. It's the work of God to bring forth love and fruit unto every good work. That's His work. Now here's what you don't want to miss. It's the Apostle Paul's personal experience of God working according to the mighty work, power that's within. And it's the church's personal experience. It's personally experiencing the work of the Holy Spirit of being conformed to the image of Christ. Every saint owns that. Every true believer owns that. Uh, last week I talked about the difference between knowledge and personal experience. You know, 18 inches from head to heart, I talked about that. Every single believer knows by experience the work in the power of God and the Holy Spirit. And if you don't, then you need to seriously question how that is working out in your life. Whether God is actually at work. Whether God's in there or not. Uh, we know it because we live it, because we see it. Be it a blessing or a discipline time. God will bless you or he will just If you're God, so bless you or discipline you. Wait, those two bookends. But you know it. God's at work. Uh, Paul tells the Philippian church, and you know the scripture well, that he who began a good work will complete it for the day of Christ Jesus. What a wonderful promise. The work is ongoing, is performed by the Holy Spirit. I said this before the Holy Spirit's work in coming as Jesus left is if Jesus were physically here himself teaching and working in and through our lives. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. He carries on Christ's ministry in Christ's absence. And, and you know the scriptures that, that he has not left us as orphans, right? We're not alone. So that's the second part of God's uh, of Paul's prayer. God's um, work according to the power that works within uh, the third part of the doxology here. And let me read it. Verse 21. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Now, I, earlier I mentioned that the church, it's not a building, right? The church is the people of God. So let me ask you this. When you, or when we, look at the church, what do we see? What are we to see? We are to see nothing less than the glory of God. When we look at the church, it's easy to see sinners. It's easy to see shortcomings. Very much. It's easy to see the spiritual warts and imperfections. Oh, she said this, he didn't do that. They're like this, right? And yet that's not what the Apostle Paul sees. And it's not what God sees. And it's not what God wants us to see. And it's not what the world should be seeing. When you see the church, you are to see the glory of God. The church is the expression of the glorious work of God in your life and heart and in the world. And that's what the Apostle Paul is saying. Now, here's the problem. Like when we think of the glory of God, what do we think of? We, we think of, you know, Moses saying to God, show me a glimpse of your glory. That's what we think of. Uh, we think of maybe the Mount of Transfiguration. You know, Jesus is transfigured. We see Peter, James, and John. And you're like, oh, you know, right? We even look at the glory of creation. We say, oh, I'll see this. The glory of God in creation. But do we look at the church and see the glory of God? Oftentimes we don't. And yet that's what the scriptures teach. The church possesses the glory of God in the person of Jesus Christ. What an amazing truth, an amazing thought, and an amazing teaching. We bear 
in our hearts the radiance of God's glory. That's an amazing truth. You know, in the Old Testament, um, we see, we read, the glory of God descended upon the camp of Israel. What did it speak of? It spoke of God being in their midst. It spoke of His presence with them. It spoke of Him working in and through them. It spoke of them being a chosen and holy people. It spoke of them being God's possession. That's what it spoke of. It spoke of them being a divine instrument in the hand of God. And this same glory of God that came, that came down in a cloud that descended upon the camp, the same glory of spirit who filled the tabernacles and the tabernacle and the temples fills our hearts in the person of Jesus Christ and in the power of the Holy Spirit. And you know, we think, oh, if only I could have been there. If only I could have seen it. If only I could have been part of that community. To see those such amazing things. We forget or we fail to realize, or we maybe we never knew that as the church, we've been the recipients of the same divine experience as in the camp of Israel. But even more so, because we're under a greater covering than we know of our perfect sacrifice. The magnificence of the glory of God in the person of Jesus Christ has descended upon his church has tabernacled in our hearts and taken up residence. And he's in our midst. That's the teaching of Scripture. He lives and he moves in mysterious ways in the church to accomplish and fulfill his will. So as the church, we express God's presence. We represent God's work. We hold forth the word of life. We lift up Christ as uh, his role and his work is as an uh, intercessor. Uh, we are the foundation and pillar of the truth. That is, we point people to Christ. As the church, we're Christ's body. Christ is the head. We're connected to God through Christ. He's brought us into union in Christ. And we're God's chosen instruments in the world. That's glorious, folks. Now, I, I shared an awful lot. Maybe it's, you know, you're kind of staggering to get your arms around it. Think of it this way. As an orchestra, Christ is the head, and he conducts. And everyone has an instrument. And everyone, therefore, plays an instrument. And in this sense, is a chosen instrument. And has a part to play. And God conducts it. And it's music for the world. That's, that's how we should understand it. And so this is why Paul breaks forth in this doxology. Because the church is the expression of the glory of God. And you and I represent that. I look at Paul's doxology here. This is the church's doxology. This isn't Paul's doxology. This is my doxology. This is your doxology. It's personal. It's ownership. It's glorious. It's beyond what we could ever hope or imagine or ask for. It's God at work. One final thought. Do you see where Paul says, uh, to him be glory in the church, in Christ Jesus, and to all generations. Now, literally, from age to age. This is amazing. The spiritual picture and sense here is that the church will proclaim the glories of her God and King into infinity and beyond. Remember that Buzz Lightyear movie? I love that, that Toy Story, Buzz Lightyear, right? To infinity and beyond. And there's this, there's just, just this picture of the spiritual cadence of 
Great praise for all eternity. From age to age to age. That's what it's going to be. And people say, oh, you know, I can't look crazy. God forever, trust me, you will not be disappointed. Because God will take a, 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 a piece of his glory and show us something different side of himself for all eternity. And we'll spread that in more praise. It's never going to end, folks. It's incredible. Paul ends his doxology with an amen. Can I get an amen? Amen. 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 Let's have a word for it. Gracious Heavenly Father, um, may you give us incredible understanding for the work uh, that you have started uh, in the church, in this world, in our lives, and in our hearts. And may it mushroom uh, in our understanding uh, and our comprehension of who we are in the person of Jesus Christ. As part of the church, may you give us incredible understanding and understand that we are a reflection of your glory, and we pray that we would, uh, uh, in, in your strength and in your spirit, uh, represent you uh, in ways that, that, that beyond what we could ever ask or imagine or think. All the praise and all the honor and all the glory, and God's people say, Amen. Okay.